Hi, for the second video, we're continuing our PowerPoint presentation on powers of attorney. And again, we're looking more particularly at financial issues here. And you're starting off with the slide, how can powers of attorney be used and misused? We'll continue on from there. So if you move forward on your slide, you'll see that financial abuse is a huge area of exploitation. We have believed for some time that it is the most common form of elder abuse, and it is commonly reported uh, in that case. Now, there may be other forms of elder abuse that are equally or even more common, but these are the ones that are reported. So why are we moving directly from powers of attorney, and particularly powers of attorney for finance, straight into financial abuse? Well, we know that while it's enormously important to be able to be thinking about advanced planning, and again, I'm, this course will focus more on advanced health planning, but we can't talk about it with also out looking at the events financial planning piece because they are interrelated as issues in people's real life. You'll remember that in our slide that said the nexus of capability financial, it said guardian, attorney, and then the power of attorney will locate someone else. So we know that it's very, very important to consider financial advanced planning. There's no default list in the way of advanced health planning. Having said that, we also know that powers of attorney are one of the most commonly used forms of documentation for financial exploitation. So are financial powers of attorney good or bad at a practical level? It's like anything else. It can help and it can hurt. So what we're trying to do is talk about what do people need to know? What are the myths? What are the challenges that you engaging with clients, engaging with patients will have in discussing the role of powers of attorney with them and with helping folks understand what their roles and responsibilities are. So we're going to move to the slide that says common myth conceptions of the donor. Now that's what it's called when somebody is making a power of attorney. The person who is the capable adult making it is the donor. They're donating, if you want to talk about that, the power to somebody else. So you see here I've got a whole bunch of different sort of excuses or misconceptions on part of the, the donor, who is probably your client or your patient if you're dealing with them. And you see here, my daughter knows what I'd want, or she'd never do anything to hurt me, or this one's very common. How often have you heard this? I want to be fair to all my kids. I'm going to appoint them all equally, and this will make it even. Or I've already made the power of attorney, and I can't take it back, or I don't know how to get it back, or I don't know how to stop it, and people have it, something like that. Or that my power of attorney from X jurisdiction is there. So in, for our case, for a person from New Brunswick, what if they moved from New Brunswick to Ontario? Is the New Brunswick power of attorney still really the best possible document to have? The answer is probably no. For the person who's receiving the power, they're called the attorney. And again, remember, we're not talking about a lawyer as an attorney. That's an American term. It's the person who holds the power, who is the receiver of the power. Really common ones. He or she's not using the money anyway, so, you know, I can use it. Or in cases where there may be some family conflict or family concern around finances, it's not really mom's money or not really her money. Dad earned it for me. Feel free to switch the gender roles, but it's very often a case of sort of resentment in there where the child says, well, you never really earned it. You never really wanted it. The other person earned it and really I'm going to have it as the child, as the person who's going to inherit it anyway, which is the next one. I'm just going to inherit it anyway, so I don't want to spend the money on my mom or my dad, I want to make sure that we preserve the money for the folks who are going to inherit, or so they think. How about this one? I don't care what she says. She gave me the power of attorney and I know what's best for her. So you remember in our last week, we talked about standing in the shoes of the other person, using the knowledge 
about their wishes and beliefs and personal desires to guide you. And this is a case of trying to use what you think or what the attorney thinks is the best interest or what you should want. So specifically ignoring the values, the wishes and beliefs of the person who's given the power in order to use kind of your own ideas about what should be done. Or this one, she's so out of it, she'll never even miss it. So she's got lots and lots of money. She's got $500,000. You know, I only need $100,000 for my house. She's never going to be able to spend that money. She's only 86. These types of things are really common misunderstandings between donors and, um, and people giving it. So I'm going to flip back a little bit to the misconceptions of the donors. I wanted to talk about both of them before we take them apart a little bit. Assuredly, your daughter does not know what you'd want, or in the case of your client, you know, when it, things come down to it, and particularly in cases where you're looking at financial issues, also in times of a healthcare crisis. So, as we know, advanced planning often has both a healthcare component and may have a financial component. A typical example would be there's a concern around their health, they've fallen and they need a particular forms of physiotherapy or adaptive care. And now we're also looking at paying for either some type of retirement home or assisted living facility or possibly a long-term care home. Each of these kinds of groupings on a practical level has both advanced health care issues and advanced financial and personal care issues. And if the person is not capable, then we're dealing with the um, the substitute decision maker. In this case, we're talking about attorneys. How about she'd never do anything to hurt me? Well, we know that that's not the case. Um, that many older people have a idea about how the relationships in the family would work and often have rose tinted glasses. They may have the unsuccessful son in the basement who's such a good boy. He's only had a little bit of trouble. But in reality, they may not have a good understanding about who their son or daughter actually is in the world. And they may, in fact, be harboring quite a lot of anger and resentment. And this donor may not fully understand how the attorney recipient feels about them. The one that we often get is, I want to be fair to my kids. I'm going to appoint them all. Can I please appoint all four of my children to be my attorney? whether that's for personal care and health or whether it's for finance, it's the same question. It is no fun thing to be an attorney. You might want to spend some time talking down. And we talked a little bit about kind of practical approaches of choosing an attorney in last week. But again, spend some time really working through the ideas about who would be the best decision maker. If it's a financial property power of attorney, who's the finance person in the family? Who's the detail person in the family? Is there an accountant or a bookkeeper or a, someone who really pays bills and pays a lot of attention to that? Because it can be a profound chore. It's no joy. And, uh, and the idea that many people will have their pens in place on the checkbook will really only make things much more difficult. It doesn't mean you can't have one or two attorneys. You couldn't have more than that. From a practical approach, it's usually not considered a good idea. So talk to your client, talk to your patient about, again, refreshing back on who's a good person to make those financial decisions. Practically speaking, some of the financial decisions can be made more long distance than the health and personal care decisions. But Picking everybody to be your uh, power of attorney is going to lead to trouble. How about I can't take it back? No, that is a misconception. You can tear up an attorney and you can send a letter letting folks know that it's been revoked. Really, to revoke a power of attorney, you just need to rip it up. But you do, for a practical level, need to tell people. So if the powers of attorney documents are out there to banks, hospitals, doctors, financial institutions, social workers, whoever else, please send a letter saying that your old power of attorney has been revoked and it'd be helpful to send a copy of the new power of attorney so that they have that on the files, but they absolutely can take it back. What about I did a power of attorney in another jurisdiction? That should be just fine. As we know, power of attorney legislation is different in different jurisdictions. And so while there may be some way of recognizing that power of attorney, if you're from New Brunswick and made it there and you move to Ontario, 
Yes, it can work. It's difficult and it's problematic. And the reality of the circumstances, practically speaking, you should just make sure that that power of attorney is redone for the new jurisdiction if they're going to be staying. Moving again to the second slide on common misconceptions of the attorney, she isn't really using the money anyway. Well, what we do know is that older adults are living much longer than ever before, and the cost of getting older is increasing. We have no real idea whether or not they will need that money. Now, that's the practical answer. The real answer, the legal answer, is it doesn't matter whether she's using the money or not anyway, it's not yours. The money always belongs to the person who has given the attorney, and the person who is the receiver of that power has an obligation to only spend that money as the values, wishes, and beliefs and best interests where required are in effect. So, you know, you can talk the person down by saying, hey, look, we have no idea how much it's going to cost for mom's care. But most of all, it doesn't matter whether it costs a little or a lot. You cannot touch that money for your personal benefit. And you do need to spend it on her as it needs to be. So that kind of speaks to the next two ones. It's not really her money. Dad earned it from me. Or I'm just going to inherit it anyway. It's her money that she's spending. No, it's the money of the person who's given the attorney. No matter how tempting it can be, that money needs to be kept separate and separately accounted for. The attorney cannot dip in. We're going to talk a little bit on our next video about some of the challenges of trying to figure out should they or shouldn't they spend the money. Is it for the best interests or not? How about these ones? You know, I don't care what she says, she'll give it to me and I'll know what's best for her. Well, for our social workers in the audience and the people who are working with uh, individuals on a practical basis in nursing and other forms of direct service care, you can see in here already the many challenges that families or collegial relationships can actually have. Often people are in very difficult situations and they want to do what's best for the adult. And that's not what an attorney is supposed to do. The attorney is supposed to act in a way that reflects the values, wishes, and beliefs of the person, not what they themselves think is a really good idea. The she's so out of it, she'll never even miss it. As you know, that smacks a lot of outright theft or abuse. So it, the whole point of having an attorney document, which continues on past the point of incapacity, is so that when a person is, quote, out of it, they have someone taking care of the financial matters, or in some cases, the health and personal care matters. But we're talking a bit more about finance. So we're going to talk now about abuse and misuse. And I'll have the slide stop right now and we'll continue it in our next video.